Hey, everyone out there. We are ready for the next chapter, which I'm going to give you the name of it in a moment, right uh, after we go through the notes to the last one. So if you remember last time, Penthesilea was this young queen of these female fighters called the Amazons. She had previously, before they went to battle, she accidentally killed her own sister while hunting deer. So she had struck her sister instead of the deer with a spear. You can only imagine how sad you might be if you killed some you know, sister or brother or somebody you care deeply about. It's got to be horrible. But Penthesilea could find no sweetness or joy left in life, so she wanted to die in battle, in like kind of courageous battle. Now, after killing many Greeks, because she came out and tried to fight the Greeks on the side of the Trojans, um, she also lost her guards in the process of fighting all and killing a bunch of Greeks. Penthesilea decided, I'm going straight for Achilles, and she charged after him, and eventually Achilles actually killed her. So he was you know, excited to kill her, but then afterwards she fell, and her helmet kind of swept off, and when he saw how young and how fair or beautiful she was, uh, Achilles himself kneeled next to her and started to weep. He started to cry for just the loss of such a young and beautiful uh, fighter. All right, so that was last chapter. Now this chapter, which... Interestingly enough, I had hid the chapter title before, but it is The Death of Achilles. Here is the cover. The chiefs and princes and old men of Troy gathered in council, so they came together to kind of talk about things. With the, king, uh, with the king, they decided that they should withdraw within the walls until King Memnon, who could not be far behind the Amazons, should reach them with the great band of Ethiopians that he was bringing to their aid. Polydemus, the most cool-headed of them all, argued that there should be no more waiting and no more war, but the Trojans should return Helen to her own people with twice the jewels that she had brought with her from the house of Menelaus. At that, Paris sprang up in rage, calling Palademus a coward, for the fate of Troy mattered little to him if he might keep Helen to himself for a while longer yet. And the Trojan war host withdrew again and waited within its walls. In a while, King Memnon came, the most beautiful of all men save for Paris and Achilles, in leading a great war band of men who had nothing white about them but their teeth, so fiercely had the sun kissed them in the land from which they came. So these Ethiopians were super dark skinned, so uh, their teeth just shined real white uh, because of the contrast. Then Priam made another feast and gave to King Memnon a great cup of gold, wine filled to the brim. These Greeks and Trojans, all of them loved to drink wine back in the days. And Memnon drank it dry at one drought, the one... But he made no boast of what he would do in battle. If I am a good fighting man, that will be known when the fighting starts, he said. Meanwhile, let us sleep, for to bide wakeful and drinking wine all night is a poor way to make ready for battle in the morning. So if any of you have ever stayed up super late at night and maybe just drinking a bunch of sugar water or even if you're an adult, some alcohol, the next morning, you're not feeling so well, right? So this guy's like, let's get to bed. The morning came and Memnon led his dark war host out onto the plain. The hearts of the Greeks would have sunk within them as they saw the bands of fresh and unwearied warriors had not Achilles in his shining armor given them courage. Memnon fell upon the left wing of the Greek army, and there he and Nestor's son Antilochus came together. Memnon leapt upon the young prince like a black lion upon a kid, and Antilochus heaved up a carved stone from a nearby tomb of ancient kings and struck out with it sending Memnon reeling back from the blow to his helmet. But the dark king came to his feet again on the instant, so real quick, and drove his spear through Antilochus's breast armor and deep into his heart, so that he fell dead before the eyes of his old father. Wow, so Antilochus is just killed. Memnon charged again, slain right and left, and stripping the armor from the dead. But Nestor, driven back from the body of his son, climbed into his chariot and forced a way through to Achilles, begging him to come with all speed to save Antilochus' body from dishonor. Achilles sped to the place where the young man had fallen, and so came face to face with King Memnon, who swung his team back to meet him. 
Memnon heaved a great stone at him, but Achilles fended it on his shield and ran on forward, wounding Memnon in the shoulder. But wounded though he was, the dark king drew back his spear and drove in a thrust that wounded Achilles in his arm. Oh boy, imagine having a spear go into your arm. and Is he going to keep fighting? What's going to happen? Little heed Achilles paid to that, though the red blood ran down, for it was not in the arm that he could receive his death wound. And they drew their swords and flew together, and with sweeping blade strokes they lashed at each other on shield and helmet. Their long horsehair crests were hacked off and went like ragged birds down on a high wind, while their shields rang to the sword strokes. They thrust at the knee below the shield rim and at the throat between shield and helmet strap. The dust flew up in a cloud from beneath their trampling feet. So there's a lot of crazy battling going on. At last, Achilles made a thrust so swift that Memnon failed to parry it, so he failed to get out of the way. The bronze blade drove clean through below the breastbone, and he crashed to the ground with the life driven from his body. So Achilles just killed King Memnon. Then Achilles raised his great war cry and thrust onward all the Greek war hosts behind him. Soon they were close before the city, and the Sian gate was choked with men and chariots, hunted and hunters. In that hour, the Greeks might indeed have forced their way into Troy, and the long siege might have ended. But Paris stood in the gate tower, fitting a new string to his bow. For the old one was frayed with much use. He chose an arrow from his quiver, leaned far out, and took aim at Achilles in the crush surged below. So, The arrow flew on its way, and Apollo guided it so that it pitched deep into the battle mass and, among all the trampling feet, found the target that it was meant for. So Apollo helped this arrow to go to the exact right place, which... Maybe you can guess where the arrow needs to hit. It struck into Achilles' ankle, in the unprotected place below the leg guard, the place where his mother Thetis had held him when she dipped her babe in the river Styx, the one spot that the water had not touched and so could let death in. So if you remember, that was his one weak area, the Achilles heel, you know. So you should be able to see Achilles there in the corner, uh, kind of in gold. There's like a sunlight on him. But look where that arrow landed. He stumbled and fell, but rose again and wheeled round, shouting, What coward has smitten me from afar? Let him come close and meet me with spear and sword. So kind of like a chicken. Come out and fight me man to man, face to face, instead of throwing an arrow, sending an arrow from afar. And he dragged the arrow from the wound, letting loose a gush of blood. There was blood everywhere. Darkness swam before his eyes. He staggered onward, striking blindly until his strength failed him, and he came to a gasping halt. Leaning on his spear, he gave a great hoarse shout, Dogs of Troy, dying though I am, you shall not escape my spears. But with the words scarce out, he fell forward in the gateway, his armor clashing about him. The Trojans stood and watched as hunters watch a dying lion, not daring to go near until the last breath is out of him. And so Hector's own dying words came true that Achilles should meet his own death at the hands of Paris in the Sian Gate. So if you remember, as Hector was dying, he had said that, Achilles, you're going to meet your own death too here. Then the Trojans in the gateway rushed forward to capture the body of Achilles in its glorious armor, while the Greeks struggled to bear it off to their camp for burial. So Achilles is dead. I mean... Round his body the fight roared to and fro, men of both armies mingling together so thick that the archers on the ramparts dared not shoot for fear of slaying their own kind. At last Odysseus, though he was wounded in the knee, caught Achilles' wrist and heaved the body upon his back, 
and so went stumbling towards the ships. Ajax and his warriors followed behind to guard them, turning and charging into the midst of the Trojans whenever they came too near. So, slowly and fighting every step of the way, they carried dead Achilles back across the plain through the bodies of the slain to the black ships. To his own hall they brought him, and there the women, Bryces first among them all, washed the blood and battle filth from his body, and laid him on a bier, spreading a white mantle over him. And they wept for him, lamenting and singing the death songs. And those who were left of the Greek leaders cut locks of their own hair for him, as he had cut his own for his friend Patroclus so short a time before. So there was just this tradition possibly of cutting some hair and putting it down with the body. Then up from the sea came his mother, Thetis of the Silver Feet, with all her maidens. They rose from the crystal chambers in the depth of the waters, moving up like the waves on a summer day, and their sweet sad singing echoed all along the shore. Then fear struck at the Greeks, and they would have fled. But old Nestor steadied them, saying, No need for fear. It is his mother with her sea maidens come to look upon her dead son. And they stood firm once more. And Thetis and the sea nymphs came and stood round him, and added their own sweet singing to the lamenting of the mortal women. The Greeks built a great stack of wood and laid Achilles on it, with sacrificed oxen and jars of oils and wine and honey, and set fire to the whole. And when the pyre was burned out, they gathered the white ashes of the hero, and mingled them with the ashes of Patroclus in the same two-handed golden cup brought out from his tomb. And over them they raised the grave mound yet higher than it had been before, and set up a tall marker stone on its crest that men passing by on land or out at sea would see it and remember who lay there. So if you've ever been to a graveyard and you see those kind of tombs, it's something like this, but even larger. Then they held the funeral games for him, chariot races and foot races, boxing and wrestling, as they had held them for Patroclus. And to all the winners, Thetis gave rich and honorable prizes. Lastly, when the games were ended, she brought out her son's bright and splendid armor, that Hephaestus had wrought for him, and, laying it at the foot of the great mound, she said, Let these arms be claimed as prize by the best and bravest of the warriors, by the one or the other of those who have saved Achilles' body out of the hands of the Trojans. So I'll show you a picture of this armor, at least a part of it. And so saying, she turned them all and went back to the sea and her sea maidens with her. Then Ajax and Odysseus stood up to claim Achilles' armor, both sure of their own worth, and both of them the bravest of the brave. And old Nestor stood up also saying, This is a grievous thing, that the best of the heroes left to us should contend for such a prize. For the loser will be sore at heart and may well feel that we have rejected him and he is not one of us as he was before. And so, so we shall suffer great loss. But if the thing must be, then let us not judge between them ourselves, lest one choosing Odysseus and another Ajax had blood, bad blood should grow between us that way. So they're basically saying, there's going to be a battle for this armor between two of like the greatest heroes, but we don't want to judge between them because one's going to feel horrible at the end. So this is just going to bring more problems. There are many Trojan captives among us, waiting for their ransoms to be paid. Let the task of judgment be given to them. So Nestor is basically wise and he's saying, instead of us Greeks dr- judging who's the best, let's get one of these uh, these prisoners from Tr- from Troy and he can judge. You know, So nobody's going to be mad at him or maybe they'll be super mad at the Trojan guy. I'm not sure. Um, that is a wise word, said Agamemnon the high king. The captain Trojans were brought out and set in the midst of the assembly, and Odysseus and Ajax, standing before them, each spoke out his claim to the armor of Achilles. Ajax spoke first, but the god Dionysus, who always rejoiced in mischief-making, so causing trouble, he breathed a kind of drunkenness into him so that he spoke roughly and foolishly, not only making his own claim, but seeking to belittle Odysseus by calling him a coward and a weakling. So sometimes when you see somebody kind of trying to make an argument or say something, they might put down the other person. Oh, and by the way, that guy's an idiot. 
you know, that type of thing. Now, the Greeks weren't too fond of that. They didn't think that was a good thing. But now Ajax is speaking like that because some god here put this magical word into him to make him speak foolishly or like he was drunk. When he had done, Odysseus said softly, Let the Trojans judge whether I have earned the ugly names that Ajax has bestowed on me, remembering my many deeds in battle against them, and that it was I who carried off the luck of Troy, remembering also that he did not find me so weak, though I had a newly healed wound on me, when we wrestled together at the funeral games for Patroclus. Then the Trojan captives agreed among themselves that Odysseus was the greater of the two who stood before them and awarded him the armor of Achilles. So Odysseus, Odysseus got the, uh, the prize of that armor. And the dark blood flew to Ajax's face and he could speak no word, but stood rigid and unmoving until his friends led him away to his own hall. There he sat to the day's end and would not eat or drink or speak for the dumb madness of the god that was in him. The madness was still with him when the dust came down. And when the dusk had deepened into the dark, the evil thoughts came swirling yet more thickly in his head. He took his sword and rushed out into the night, making for the hall of Odysseus to hack him limb from limb. Dude, Ajax has seriously gone mad here. He's going to go attack Ajax. Odysseus and try to kill him? But before he reached it, he came upon the flock of sheep which the Greeks kept for their meat, and he plunged into the fold, raging up and down, slaying blindly as he went, knowing nothing but the urge to kill. Yikes. And when the dawn came, he, his senses returned to him. He saw that he had not slain Odysseus, but stood in a pool of blood with the hacked carcasses or bodies of dead sheep all about him. I'm going to show uh, this image for you. It's not too graphic. So. As you can see, he doesn't look too happy with himself there. He could not live with the disgrace of the madness that had come upon him. He fixed his bloody sword with its hilt set firmly in the ground. So you, the bottom part of the sword in the ground and then the, the sharp part up. And drew back a little, then ran and fell forward upon the point that took him cleanly through the heart and so made an end. So Ajax literally just killed himself because of this. Whew. Well... I mean, I'm, it's tough to say, but that's the end of that chapter. So, yikes. Uh, Achilles is dead. Ajax is dead. I mean, there's so many people that have now died, and including the strongest of all strong fighters, Achilles. So, um, I actually wore black today because of these deaths. Uh, it's tough. So, I'll ask you one question. I'll just give you one question. Why at the end, Ajax, what would make somebody fall on their swords? That's literally fall into the sword, goes through his heart and dies. Like, why would he think he needs to do that? What would make him think that? So that's my question for you. Now, the face I want you to have is, let us do Achilles as he's dying. So what do you think he is looking like when he's dying? This is an interesting one. So I'm going to... So I kind of went into the face. So it's up to you if you just want to have one straight face or kind of fade into it. Um, but that is it, guys. I'm sorry for this chapter in the darkness and the death but that's the reality of this story the next chapter will be poisoned arrow we'll see what that's all about all right adios for now guys